might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. This is God's word. Thank you so much for reading that. Um, good morning, Grace Lake Highlands. It is wonderful to be here with you. Uh, Charlie is one of my favorite people. I say that and I mean it. Uh, definitely one of my favorite preacher teachers. Uh, we got to spend a good bit of time, and it was a gift uh, when we were in the John McStay Bible study together. I grew so much. It was very selfish. It was a guilty pleasure. All I did was show up and bug Charlie with a bunch of questions. Um, but it was, it was such a wonderful time. And I already had affection for Charlie before that. And, of course, we, you know, at, at Highland Park Prez and his preaching and our conversation. So thank you, Charlie, for allowing me to be here this morning. Uh, I'm going to open in prayer and then talk a little bit, and we'll get right to the word. Uh, let's pray. Lord God, I just uh, can't thank you enough for the way that your, mo your movements are showing up in this city, across this city. Thank you for the leadership that we have here in this place. Charlie, thank you for the progress we see with uh, construction equipment outside. Thank you for the many people that are here. Lord, I ask that you just uh, open up our minds so we may understand the word you have for us, soften our hearts, so we will accept this word and then strengthen our character so we may go out and manifest this word, your word, in a way that brings glory to your name and hope to your people. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And I want to give a big shout out and thank you to the men of Grace Lake Highlands. They showed up uh, some weeks back uh, at our uh, food a distribution spot. I think we have a picture of them. And they were just, um, just helped us. There they are, this beautiful picture. And let's just give it up for the Highland, I mean the Grace Lake Highlands men. They helped us uh, serve about 600 families and got us prepared to serve 600 families or 650 uh, that Thursday evening and that get together. So we're just so grateful and appreciative for your friendship and support. Well, Charlie, thank you for being my friend. I'm deciding if I'm going to thank you for having me preach this topic. And have you, who, who's prayed for patience? Anybody ever prayed? Okay. You guys know what happens when you pray for patience, right? Well, praying for gentleness with our enemies. Can you imagine what the last few weeks have been like for me? <laughs> It's been an enjoyable time, but it, it, it has actually stretched me, and it's been a beautiful time of sitting with the Lord and struggling, because it is not easy to be gentle, especially in this day and age. I think Charlie mentioned that earlier. We are in a time where gentleness is seen as a weakness. Meekness is weakness, and it is so easy to, to uh, follow the world instead of lead as a church and look like Jesus. And so I, I've, I've, had some, I've had some times. I've had some times. I've just, you know, and, and, and enemies, it's not all enemies. Enemies aren't just people. They're things, you know. Enemies can come up in different ways. The things that oppose you, oppose your progress, and I had lots of that. But the Lord was uh, working with me. And, um, but... One that wasn't an enemy situation, about a month ago, I had the benefit of going to my home church. I grew up in Southern California, just uh, uh, east of Los Angeles, and it was the church's 60th anniversary. And I, you know, it was wonderful. I saw people that I grew up with. Uh, my father was a pastor there for 37 years, and it was just a wonderful, joyous experience. And then I saw people I hadn't seen in forever. One such person, name is Kena Giles. And Kena, I met in kindergarten. And Kena was my first love. <laughs> so Kena taught me something. Kena, I was definitely a five-year-old boy at this point. 
And Kina during recess, I mean, we, we didn't interact with girls, you know, boys in recess, we, you know, I have jungle gym work, we race, and we played our version of football with the rubber ball, and we ran in circles and just tackled each other on the asphalt, and that's how we played. And, and so, and, and Kina sat me down during recess, and she sat me down and she said, Junior, because that's what I was called back then, Junior, you're going to be my boyfriend. <laughs> oh, okay. And, and I will be your girlfriend. And, I, you know, I didn't know. Okay, that's fine. Uh, that's great. And uh, can I go play again now? And, so it was like, and then she let me go play. And, we, and the, the rule was I had to say hello to her in the morning. I mean, when we came in, I got to say hello. And we're boyfriend and girlfriend. Great. And I just went on. And, and I love how she sat me down and she explained it to me. I could see her. She explained it all to me because I was a guy even back then. And it still happens to this day. Now my wife does it. And, <laughs> and, 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 and about what I found out is I didn't know what a good deal this was. Because we walked home and I, my older sister walked me home. She was about four years older than me. And she and her friends were walking me home, and I just told them, I said, hey, you know, we're talking, oh, and I have a girlfriend, whatever that means, and they go, girlfriend, and then they were all, they got, their voices went higher, they all came down to me, you know, I got extra candy, extra attention, I'm like, oh, this girlfriend thing is kind of pretty good, you know, I didn't know, I didn't know I was going to come up like that, so, so it helped my public profile, I was feeling pretty good about it, and about a week later, probably, but in kindergarten years, they're kind of like dog years. You know, a week is like seven weeks in kindergarten years. But about, probably about a week later, Kina stopped me and, brought, and, and recess again, sat me down right around the same place and said, Junior, we're going to have to break up. <laughs> and I'm, I'm listening. She goes, yes, I have a new boyfriend. Okay, my new boyfriend is Michael Jackson. <laughs> yes, that Michael Jackson. And I wasn't for or against Michael Jackson until that moment. <laughs> and I could care less about A, B, C, 1, 2, 3, and Dore Me at that point. And so I found my first enemy, Michael Jackson. <laughs> and so I learned something about enemies. They take things from you. They hurt your feelings. He was taking away my public profile. I was okay with letting Kina go, but I couldn't tell my friends and my family, I mean, my, my neighborhood that I had a girlfriend anymore. And by the way, I took the girlfriend thing back to my five-year-old boys, friend, uh, all my uh, guy friends, and they were, they were just as out of the know, but I was in the know. So I became big man on Facebook. So I was CMO at that point. We good? All right. And, and, so, and so I lost a lot of my status, and I lost my girlfriend, because enemies bring you hurt and harm. And in our world, we see enemies in all kinds of places. And the, uh, the, the, the enemy of Michael Jackson was one. And, and what is an enemy? I thought about an enemy. Is there something I need to do? That's better? All right, good deal. So an enemy, a personal enemy, I decided to look up enemies. So I went to Cambridge uh, Dictionary, and he gave examples. A personal en enemy. Here's, here's an example of a personal en enemy. Max stole Lee's girlfriend, and they've been enemies ever since. Thank you, Cambridge Dictionary. That literally came from them. I'm like, I didn't need that. But it also can be a thing. So a thing like a routine is the enemy of art. And we can also be our own. You guys have heard this? Our own worst what? We can be our own worst enemy because we do things that are against our best interest. So enemies show up in all kinds of forms. And and and. When you're young and when, you know, five-year-old junior, five-year-old Will, you know, I didn't understand this enemy thing until the Michael Jackson incident. But I also have a granddaughter. Well, actually, we have two sons. They don't have daughters, but we decided to 
kind of, I don't know, do you have a hostile takeover? We, my wife and I just fell in love with this little girl, and we made her our granddaughter, and the parents just said, okay, you guys are kind of aggressive with it, so we weren't <laughs> gentle. Uh, uh, and so, and so uh, her name is Jordan, and there's Jordan. And Jordan, this is, this is during her first week of kindergarten. And I said, Jordan, who is your best friend? And she looked at me and said, they're all my best friends. And I, I, yeah, of course, I hugged her, gave her car keys, my wallet, everything I could get. And, and, and that peace that she had with people, she has phenomenal parents. She actually has great grandparents by blood as well as us. And she has a family, big brothers that love her to death. There's a peace that she has. And I've watched her. Even when other kids are upset, she walks over and she hugs them. She does not take on their uh, demeanor because she has peace. And it hit me that we can't be gentle with our enemies if we do not have peace. And as we go into this scripture, Jesus is literally on a peace mission. Jesus is the prince of what? He's a prince of peace because he is reconnecting our relationship and helping us have a right relationship with God and with man. And if we don't have peace, and what we see over and over in our society is that people do not have peace. And why there's so much fighting is because there's no inner peace because there's a, there's a God-shaped hole in their hearts and in their souls. And if we don't uh, uh, reflect Jesus, it's hard for us to bring that gentleness into our society. So the question is, how and why? Even better question, why should we be gentle with our uh, enemies? Well, when we look at our enemies, we, 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 the first thing that happens when we uh, decide to be gentle with our enemies we find this, uh, let me get to it, gentle. The first reason why we should be gentle with our enemies is because gentleness can expose character. Gentleness can expose character. So when we look at verses 47, I'll jump back and read that real quick. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the 12, arrived with him was a large crowd armed with swords, clubs, and sent, sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man to arrest. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus replied, Friend, do what you came for. Then the men stepped forward and seized him and arrest him. Think about that picture. Jesus has gone from being uh, 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 celebrated as he comes in. Hosanna, Hosanna on the highest, laying out coats and palm branches. And he's walking in, uh, riding in, and the people are running after him. And just a few days later, he's dealing with this. A few hours earlier, he's washing the feet of all of his, all of his disciples, including Judas, and now this, a few, a few hours earlier, he's praying, sweats, sweating blood, blood and sweat for this cup because of his love. And in all of that, through all of the stress, when Judas shows up with the friends that are really foes, that he calls Judas friend. That is just so odd to me. Why would he call him friend? And when G Jesus called Judas friend, he called them friend because Jesus doesn't change. See, see, when we have gentleness and we have the Lord, we don't change who we are because of what someone else is. What we do is we live up to who we are, and then what, who we are shows up in such a way that speaks to the character not only of us, but the character of the Lord that we serve. 
And so when Judas shows up and he does that she, and kisses him, and it's so fake. And, you know, Judas's name means praise. And sometimes you're going to get fake, phony praise from people who pretend to be your friends. But what, what, what gentleness allows us to do is not attack them, but to see them and hear them according to how the Lord is showing us. Now, Jesus knew who Judas was, but the disciples didn't. But if Jesus actually allowed this whole thing to turn into a war, which the chief priests were setting up, then it would have been hard to see the character of Judas. But not only was it that, but the, the, the religious leaders were also problematic because they said they want this God. They were looking forward to this Savior coming. They were looking forward to the Messiah. They just didn't like the way the Messiah showed up. And so when we have a, 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 a people who oppose us, sometimes they're going to want what they want their way. They don't want the truth. They want what they want to lift themselves up. If the, if the religious leaders were really concerned about the people, the one thing they would have done is they would have been happy when Jesus healed uh, uh, Peter's, Peter's uh, wife. Or they would have been happy when he healed the deaf mute. Or when he healed the paralytic at Bethesda. Or when he healed, healed blind Bartimaeus. Or when he healed the woman with the issue of blood. And they would, have, they would not have went belligerent when he raised Lazarus from the dead. But that is not their character. But if Jesus is yelling at them, if Jesus is going crazy on them, he could, they could not see. The, the, um, the, the disciples, the people, the followers, the true believers could not see the true character of those folk. So why be gentle? To make sure we see the true character and we can hear the Lord speaking in his still, quiet voice to us if we're not yelling at others. But not only that, not only that, the other piece is it, it also allows the gentleness. The gentleness can uncover motives. So Jesus' gentleness towards even his friend, his friend Peter. Peter's in the inner circle of the inner circle. And in the midst of that, Peter is committed to Jesus, but he's also allowing his flesh to drive him. Because when he comes down to it, Peter, Peter goes all Peter. I'm kind of, I'm a Peter fan because, yeah, I'm a lot like Peter on my good days. And worse than Peter on my bad days. Peter, what does Peter do? Peter does a few things. Peter talks too fast. He'll, he'll cut you. And he doesn't mind cursing. Okay? Because this is what Peter does. And in this, Peter, when they, when they all come, Peter's like, oh, we're going down. I told you, Jesus, I'll die for you. Wham! And he takes out Malchus, Malchus's ear at least. And that's because Peter's motives weren't vastly different than Judah. Uh, than, uh, 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 what's his name? Uh, say his name because it's just... Judas, yeah, I did, I thought it was Judas. His motives were the same as Judas in the sense he wanted a physical overthrow of the Roman kingdom. The difference was Satan hadn't entered his heart like Satan had entered Judas's heart. So sometimes when we think people are out to destroy us, the problem is they're just disappointing us. But if we give them a harsh word, we don't give them enough time to recover. And they don't give enough, uh, uh, we don't give enough uh, uh, cover for them to come back into the fold. Now, Peter was not alone with wanting that, but Peter was the most vociferous in wanting the, the, the physical overthrow. And so when it was time to get back to the uh, upper room, Peter was welcomed in. Of course, Judas wasn't there. Now, it depends on who you listen to. If the Luke's account, Judas may have been still alive. And Matthew's account, Judas had hung himself. Either way, we do know this. Judas was not back in the upper room when the risen Christ came back. And, that, and, and Peter was there because I believe that part of it was Jesus' gentleness in dealing with Peter when he 
kind of went rogue against God's plan. And, and think about this. Think about what Peter was actually doing. Peter wasn't only putting himself at risk. He was putting all of the disciples at risk. He was putting the plan of God at risk because it was not, the kingdom of God was spiritual at this point. It was not time to have a physical battle. And if, if Jesus did not heal uh, Malchus's ear, maybe it would have been a fight. Peter could have been killed. Now, Jesus, God's plan will come through, but Peter could have been a stumbling block. But Jesus' gentleness exposed the character, but it also exposed Jesus' character because he was teaching. He was teaching how to be gentle in the midst of great stress. And that's a big part of being meek. Meekness is not weakness. Meekness is strength that you do not utilize for your own personal benefit. And when we are dealing with enemies, when we're dealing with people that come against us, and, and in this world we, we have everything from sports to political to your neighbors. You hear this over and over again. We have people that are upset when they're driving, and I don't know if you ever received a, uh, a single finger salute from someone because you didn't change lanes fast enough. The, the, the amount of stress is beyond uh, uh, just my understanding, our understanding. Our job is still to be gentle. I've watched this. And one of the, one of the situations I had this week that was wonderful, and I actually thought, man, these young ladies aren't studying this. I am, and I was a little frustrated. My mother's 85. So I'm a big part of helping take care of, taking care of her. My two sisters are helpful, too. But I was at one of her favorite places, Cracker Barrel. And I was getting her order. And there was a poor lady. She's a senior. And she's working. Kind of wasn't trained. And she was struggling. And I watched. She literally took 40 minutes on ringing up an order. And that was mine. The young ladies behind me, it was even worse. And they were young, 19 to 25, and they were so caring. They were so gentle with her. And it relieved me, and it relieved her, and it relieved the people around us the way those young ladies were. And see, that's what gentleness does. If we can be gentle with things that are opposing us, because, again, enemies are also things that oppose us. Sometimes we feel that... Uh, when I was growing up, I had, I had a best friend. His name was Terrence. His parents really loved him, and they bought him a Z28 Camaro. We were seniors in high school. My parents had a different kind of love, and they let me drive. <laughs> they let me drive their powder blue four-door Ford Granada six-cylinder, okay? And some of you don't know cars, but that's like the worst car ever. <laughs> but here's where the love, my, I felt my parents were opposing me. But here's the thing that Terrence did. When I was the 17-year-old me, it was like, Terrence, you get this phenomenal Z28. It was new. I'm like, dude, go over the speed limit. We'd be driving like, let's go, let's go, man. I can hear the sound. I'm like, let's go. I raced the Granada. Didn't do much, but I would race the Granada at that day. And he wouldn't. Terrence and I were struggling with ministry calls and all that. Terrence accepted his ministry call in high school. Terrence married his high school sweetheart. Terrence was way more mature than me. If the Lord would, have, if my parents would have given me that car, I'm not sure I would be here. And the reality was I felt that they were opposing my best interest. And that's what happened with Peter. Peter felt that Jesus was opposing his best interest. But love, gentleness, takes care of us and allows us to just stay in the fold and struggle through. So, so the first thing I want to make sure you understand is, look, gentle, a gentle word, gentleness, allows us that gentleness can expose character. Secondly, gentleness can um, uncover motives. And finally, gentleness points us to the prophetic word of God. 
So if we go down to verse, verse 50, 55, 54. But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? At that time, Jesus said to the crowd, am I leading a rebellion that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I sat in the temple courts teaching, and you, get, you did not arrest me. But this has taken place that the writings of the prophet may be fulfilled. Then, then all the disciples deserted him and fled. That just seems so tough, so painful. So Jesus is teaching in the temple, and, and, and the prophetic word said, it's not his time. So when he's in the temple, you remember in Cana, the wedding in Cana, Jesus said, my time, mom, my time has not come. In John 7, when he was going into the feast of, 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 the feast of folds and, 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 and uh, the feasts of booths, and, and his brother said, you want to have a public ministry? Go in and show yourself and go to the town. And he just told his brothers, my time has not come. Because the prophetic word should be fulfilled as it was given. And so what, what Jesus was doing was waiting for his time. And it was a struggle. But because he gently taught over and over, he taught his, he ta he taught his disciples three different times that he was going to die. They didn't accept it. He just kept teaching, kept teaching. And, and when he finally did, when the time came, they remembered because he had taught gently. But it allows us to see what the Lord is telling us. And it's confusing. What it does is a gentle word takes away the confusion of a prophetic word. It was, you're God. You're, you're powerful. We've seen you do all these things. Why would you die? But the prophetic word released them from once over, over a while, his public ministry and the start of the public ministry in John 7, um, the, the, the word released, uh, excuse me, the word helped them see over time that God's word will come true. And then ultimately, Jesus taught from Ze Zechariah 13, 7, when you strike the shepherd, the sheep will flee. And that did happen. But he taught it. He prepared them because we need to be prepared for what's coming. And so as the Lord is teaching us gently, as we teach others gently, as we help others gently, our big word is to, our job is to help others understand what's coming, but do it gently, do it meekly, do it not based on what our needs are, but based on what the Lord has called us to do. And the last, this is the last thing. I, I, I ran into a guy. We work with a, a company called Renew. And there was a young man by the name of Roy. We were just visiting with him. And Roy had been through a lot. And there's a picture of Roy. And Roy struggled with God, but he needed a gentle word, a gentle prophetic word. And uh, Roy had... Um, Struggled with alcohol, heroin. He had two children, lost them. He, his, 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 his wife, I believe, I can't remember if it was his wife or girlfriend, uh, they broke up. And uh, he'd gone in and out of prison. And the last time he went to court, Judge Cruzo, he told me, decided to send him into rehab. When he went to rehab, he found he, he was given a mentor. Or, and, and the mentor was a man that was much older than him, very different than him, and he struggled. He's like, why am I dealing with this guy? And the mentor said to him, he goes, well, I'm going to be here for you, but I need you to connect with the Lord. There's no way to get sober without the Lord. And Roy told me, I'm through with the Lord. I didn't want to hear that. There's no, the Lord can't help me. And then so he told, the, he told his mentor, I tried God. I'm not going to deal with God. Well, his mentor said, don't try your God. Try my God. So every night, you call on my God. And, he, and, and Roy's like, I don't want to do that. And, he, just, and the guy, he kept saying it gently and carefully. You call on my God. And then he went to Zechariah. 
excuse me. I'm not going to pull up the scripture. I, did, I, I left it off. But he, he went to the, oh, Jeremiah, excuse me, Jeremiah 33. Three. He says, call to me, I will answer and will answer you and tell you great and mighty things which you do not know and understand and cannot distinguish, which you do not know and understand and cannot distinguish. Jeremiah 3.33. That's what Roy said the guy told him. He said, just call on him and you will find out things that you could not fathom, not in your heroin state, not in your alcoholic state, not in your in and out of prison state. 17 years ago, he's been sober for 17 years because he called on his mentor's God. And that prophetic word worked, but it was a gentle word over and over and over from his mentor. And today, not only does he have his children, but he has an extra child. Not only is he, he, he has those three children, but he's married. Not only is he married, but he's gainfully employed. Not just gainfully employed, but he's in charge of several projects. He has several people reporting to him. He could not fathom that. He could not see that in any way. But if he did not receive the gentle word, not a word where you're, you're a drug addict, get yourself together. You should follow this God. He received the gentle word from his mentor, and he saw things that he could never, ever, ever believe could happen. Amen? Let's be gentle. Let's pray. Lord God, we just thank you for uh, the picture that you've shown us through Christ and how Christ loved us and how Christ is gentle and meek, how Christ makes sure that our needs are met. Help us to do that, especially with our enemies. Your word says, love your enemies. And Lord, we want to love our enemies as Christ loved us because we at one point were enemies to, to Christ. So Lord, just give us the clarity on how to do that. And Lord, we thank you for the hope that we have in Jesus. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Will. Friends, it was just before the